<sighs> this form an analysis, just waiting around for someone to show up. Check. Hello, Carl. Hey, Doc. How you doing? Man, I'm all right. How you doing? I'm good. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, we got an appointment today at 1, right? That's correct. Cool. You got my phone number? No, I don't. Don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'm going to text it to you. Or, uh, I'm going to go to uh, uh, Canvas right now and text it. And the reason I'm giving you my phone number is just in case that you uh, something goes wrong with me or with you, you can call me. All right? Okay. So let's see. I'm just replying to the last thing you, you said right here. And... Uh, So I, I just sent it to you. You don't have to look at it right now, but it will be in your inbox in Canvas. Um, 
Let me get rid of this page. Gotcha. All right. So, so just in case something goes wrong, um, I don't think anything's going to go wrong. But I have been known to be sitting here working on something and time just goes by because I forgot to set the alarm. I usually don't. Anyways, you and I want to get started with this uh, fugue. Okay. Uh, you, it's, uh, you, you could call it fugue form, okay? But it, but it doesn't have an exact form like Sonata that you can say, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. Um, although the exposition, which is the beginning, has a formula that is always followed. So just got to be aware of that. So the basics of, of a fugue is uh, a fugue is regarded as the pinnacle of counterpunctual achievement. This is, this is all counterpoint. Baroque period was counterpoint, counterpoint, counterpoint. Uh, the process involves the working out of usually a single theme over the course of a movement. All right, so, so th this yields a product whose character and design varies. All right, so like Sonata form, you, you knew you were gonna have in the exposition certain amount of things. And in this, we call it an exposition and we're gonna have a certain amount of things, all right? But after that, it varies, all right? So, but it's not a form, of course, you have the development and then you have the recapitulation, all right? So, so it is, it is a different. So a strict few consists of a given number of counterpunctual voices, which are known as parts, all right? As little as two and rarely more than five, okay? So all voices state the few theme subject one after another in the onset, okay? The opening set of entries is called the exposition. The main body of the fugue consists of episodes and restatements of the fugue, all right? But you don't know how those episodes are gonna work. You don't know how those restatements are gonna work also. So, so again, it's, it, it's not a cut and dry thing. Um, one of the reasons I kind of saved this for last, even though it's chapter eight is, uh, well, there's a couple of different reasons. First of all, the paper that we're gonna be, we, work, we are working on. Uh, and, and secondly, I think this is the most complicated chapter of all. Um, so, so that's why I save it for last. Anyways, the exposition, which is the opening part, all right? It has, it, there are really strict guidelines to this. The first voice is, voice is going to state the subject in a clear sense of the tonic key. It's got to give you the tonic key. The first voice continues with new material as the second voice enters in the dominant key. All right. Um, this is called the answer. All right. The procedure is followed with each new voice enters in the statement. These voices are normally in the tonic, donic, dominant relationship. So, so if it's a, a three voice fugue, you're gonna get tonic, you're gonna get dominant, then you're gonna get tonic again. If it's a two voice fugue, you're gonna get tonic and dominant, and then it's all over, all right? Four voice, tonic, dominant, tonic, dominant, all right? And then uh, five voice, you get tonic, dominant, tonic, dominant, tonic. All right, so I'm going to share something with you. I hope I'm going to share it. Share this. Um, share. So, so here's the exposition. Let's just say these are the, the four. Do you, you see the uh, book here? Mm-hmm. I uh, do. So, um, so here's the exposition. Uh, these are the four voices. Let's just, this is the soprano. This is the alto. This is the tenor and this is the bass. Okay. So, so if the subject starts in, in, in the, in the tonic key, the answer, it could be any voice that answers it, but they're just given an example of it. All right. And it could be any voice that starts also, uh, the answer is going to be in the dominant and then the subject comes back in the tonic key and the answer will be in the dominant. And of course, if you have a fifth voice, the subject will start in the tonic key again. All right. So um, this is the four voice one. It says up here, actually, there are 24 possibilities in order to soprano, alto, tenor, and bass, which is four voices. Uh, 
um, in a four voice fugue, uh, S-A-T-B, S-A-B-T, S-T-A-B, so on and so forth, you know, so you could maneuver them anyways. Um, but, but down here, he's just giving the alto followed by the soprano, followed by the tenor, followed by the bass. All right. Um, occasionally, eh, here, let's just play this. I think I have this example. Um, yeah, I do. Let me play this example for you. Um, give me the opportunity to, uh, figure out where it is. Boom. I need to bring up. This, this, uh, while I'm here, I'm just going to share this window, new share. Um, so we have a new module. It's module 12. I just opened it up. This is the playlist and this is the, the playlist that I'm going to go to, to, in order to, um, play the material. And then we have this chapter eight terms here. All right. So these, these, these are somewhat confusing, but they're really not. If you follow the book, Carl, follow the book. All right. So anyways, um, I need to put you down for attendance here. Sorry about that. Boom, boom, boom. Boom. Today's the third. Carl, make sure you vote if you haven't. That's all I got to say. I am. Yeah, I'm headed up to do that soon. I'm headed up right after this class to do it also. Um, so so then uh, if, to look at some of the examples, I don't have all of them. It would be on OneDrive, which is that link right, this right here, which is you were to go here, click on the link. I'm sure you know this already here. There it says link. All right. Mm -hmm. So it brings you to this OneDrive. So now I'm going to uh, go back to what I was sharing with you. We're going to just take a listen to this subject and answer. All right. Uh, this is out of the book. Now, most of these things were written for either clavier or organ. All right. But a lot of times you're going to find the clavier stuff done on piano nowadays. And I've chosen the piano on these examples because I, I feel that you can hear it better. Sometimes the, the clavier doesn't have much in the dynamics area. So it's kind of hard to sometimes you got a bunch of tingling things around and sometimes it's hard to hear it. However, in box days, that's what they were used to listening to. All right. And, and, and so their ears were trained to hear the different voices. So uh, here we go. This is uh, example number, the one that's on the screen. Um. Sorry, Carl. Let me uh, start it all over now that I have the screen that I was looking for. Let me make sure I really have the right one. All right, let me start it all over. Here we go. Yes. Answer. talk about this in a minute. Subject. Okay, so it's all over because it's a three voice fugue. And you actually heard the subject come in again at the end there. All right, so So occasionally you're going to find some extra material um, that, that's been added 
um, before another entry and end of the subject. And really, this is known as a codetta or a link. Okay, now, now I need to, to make sure you understand this, that th this isn't the same as a codetta, like in the middle of sonata form when you, the exposition is over and you have a codetta at the end. But codetta means little tail, okay? Um, and this is what this is. It's a little tail to get us from the dominant key back to the tonic key for the entry of the subject here. All right, and that's all this is right here. So we have the answer that ends right here in the soprano voice. And we have this little codetta to bring us from the dominant key back to the tonic key for the new entry of the subject. Most of the time you're gonna find that, I, I can't really say most of the time, you're either, it's either gonna be there or it's not, all right? It'll be really pretty obvious. Um, so let's go back to the, the subject here. When the subject is completed, all right, in the very beginning is when the answer starts. So then you know how long the subject is. It kind of alives into the answer. And then this is other material going on here. So this subject, we're in 4-4, four, four, all right, because we count downbeats, all right? So this is one, and, okay, so this is a uh, one, two, three, four. This is four measures, so, or four beats. So this is one, two, three. It's like, you, you would call this three measures long. It's really shy of three measures, all right? Um, and the answer is one, two, and it's to the downbeat of three. It's really gonna, they're all, they're all gonna be three measures long, all right? Uh, it's the counting part that's, that's interesting. Um, uh, if, if, if I was to say in, in a paper, if I was writing a paper, I would say the answer comes in you know, um, in the middle of measure one, two, three, where the ending is. So the subject, as soon as the subject is concluded, the answer comes in, all right? So then the answer went to here, and then we have something to get us to the next place, the subject again here. Is that understandable? Yes, it is. Well, cool. let's listen to it again, and let's listen for that code data or tail. Here it is. So that's pretty easy to, to see, particularly in this piece, because it's soft, it's slow, and it's pretty obvious because there's a large amount of space. Sometimes it could be a very small amount of space. Um, all right, so, so again, occasionally you'll find this extra material to be added to the subject, all right? Um, and it's known as a codetto or link. The purpose is to modulate back to the tonic for another entry of the subject. So it's really just a connective feature. That's all this codetto or link is. I like to call it a link more than a codetto, but it's, it's the same thing when you're talking about a fugue, whereas a, a, a codetto in a sonata form isn't a link, all right? It's usually the ending of something and it's just something tacked on to the final cadence normally. Um, so when the second voice enters, the material that uh, continues in the first voice can be one of two types, all right? Uh, the first is free counterpoint. It could be just doing whatever it wants to do, and it, you know, and, and it doesn't reappear anymore uh, again. Um, so in this, in this, idea of, of free counterpoint, you might find um, motives from the subject or you might not find. It's just gonna do whatever it wants to do. Um, 
However, often, and I'm really stressing this, often the material that appears against the second entry has a special significance to it, all right? Um, the material, if the material is used consistently against the subject, it is known as a counter subject. So occasionally some fugues have a second counter subject and we'll not, and, um, we'll not worry about that at the moment. Um, but uh, let's see here. So we have an example eight to what we have as a counter subject. And the only reason we know this is because here it is right here. And uh, love how they got a natural and then a sharp sign here. <laughs> because see this double sharp right here? Carl? Yeah, I see it. And he's, he's, he's naturaling out the first sharp because that's in the key signature. And then he puts the sharp in just to make sure that everybody understands that. All right. Uh, I, I guess I, I never really, I've never run into this situation personally. And I, I think that that might be confusing. I think I would just get sharp I right just say, well, is that a natural, that is a natural and a sharp. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. What he's doing is he, he's canceling out the double sharp right here. All right. Yeah. And then he puts a sharp in with the natural sign, cancels out that, and puts a sharp in. Or the other thing it could be is he's he's uh, saying that this is F natural, and now it's F sharp. I personally would have just put an F sharp there, all right? And everybody would know that this is F double sharp, and this is F sharp, right? Right. Yeah, okay. So anyway, yeah, here's... Coming. Go ahead. I was just saying that was crazy. I know that's like some foolishness. Yeah. <laughs> I, I never thought finale would do no stuff like that. Well, this isn't finale. Oh, it, it might be, but yeah, finale will do that. You got to right. manipulate it for it to do it. It won't. It won't allow you to to like you select a note and then you say make it sharp or make it flat or natural. Right. You have to you have to actually import the that into the score. Now they might have been using something else. I have no idea what they're using here, uh, but you're gonna get that in these key signatures that have a lot of sharps in them. <laughs> You'll get them in a lot of flat keys too. Um, anyways, um, anyway, so here we have the counter subject, and we can just kind of look at it. And I want you to notice this goes from C up to C. And then it goes, uh, or C sharp up to C sharp. Then it goes, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. It goes B sharp. Everything's a sharp here. B sharp, C sharp, D sharp, so on and so forth. And then when it comes in again, here it is right here. It starts here. All right. Notice that's in treble clef. Uh, let me make sure I'm getting the right spot here. Okay, it doesn't start at the bottom note. It starts at 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 this note right here. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so so it goes down, and then it goes up and up and up, and here it goes down, and then it goes up and up and up. There's that double sharp again, and the, oh here here it is again. Um, F natural, uh, F sharp. <laughs> mm -hmm. But anyway, it's basically the same thing. Sometimes the intervals aren't quite the same, but most of the time they're going to be exact. We consider that a counter subject. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, so uh, I'm pretty sure I have this number two. So we'll listen to this. So we have a subject, then we have a uh, an answer, a counter subject, and uh, it ends on the low note. It's a leap of a seventh. Uh, so this, this is where it ends, and we probably got maybe, uh, well, uh, this is where it starts. So it ends, there is no, in this particular one, there is no coda or link, all right? It just comes right in because the counter subject starts up and then the subject, and maybe it is a little bit of a link right here, um, but 
Who knows? But we'll we'll take a listen to it and see what happens here. Boom. Sorry. Uh, oh, I might have cut that off early, or I maybe I didn't. Here we go again. There's the counter subject. All right. So I didn't. I I didn't cut it off. <laughs> I just. All right. Anyways. So. Um, Moving on, let's just talk about the subject, okay? The, the fugue subject really has a, a, a quality of recognizability, although I spelled the word wrong, recognizability. Um, a subject's beginning idea is memorable and is easily recognizable. So in this one, we had that great, uh, we had this, and then that leap, and, uh, and you'll find out that these things like this is, is how you recognize the subject. You might not actually recognize the very beginning of it, but once it leaps up, then you, then, oh yeah, we're in that subject. All right. Um, so it really needs to be memorable and easily recognizable in its subsequent appearances when it appears later on in the fugue. Um, it's got to clearly reflect the tonic key. Um, they can be, they can be of considerable length, range, and intervallic content. In other words, you don't know what it's going to be. Um, and they will shape in, in general character. You just kind of don't know what it means. So they can be of any length, any range. They have all kinds of intervals, all kinds of chromatic notes if they want. Uh, Bach got a chromatic fugue, so there's all kinds of different things they can do. Uh, interval content, general shape, and character. So... You never know what it's going to be, but you know what it's going to be because it starts at the very beginning and it's the only voice playing. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Cool. Hey, I got a third person. Yes. Is that Bremmy? Yes. Good morning, Bremmy. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. All right, so that's really important to understand. All right. Um, so, so the subject got to display some sort of um, combination of pitch and rhythmic elements to make it stand out from its surroundings. All right. And, and it's, it's pretty, you can really hear the subject when it comes in right here, but it's much harder to hear the subject here because now we've got three voices moving along. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it shifted to the bass clef. All right. So let's just listen to this one more time. It's a really slow thing or a fast thing. I'm sorry. All right. So it's a little bit harder to hear right there. Um, but that's the name of the game. Um, listening. All right. So it's got to be able to stand out from a surrounding. Now, I'm a clavier. I don't think that really would st stick out to me. But, of course, I already said that people's ears were trained in those days for the clavier. All right. And I'm using piano because I think it sticks out better. All right. Answer. So we have a subject. We have an answer. All right. After the first voice enters with the subject, the second voice enters with the answer. All right? And again, here's the subject. Here's the answer. Um, so the first voice enters with the subject. The second voice enters with the answer. Traditionally, it's at the interval of a perfect fifth or a uh, perfect fifth above or a perfect fourth below. Um, and it, uh, below the subject. And it's in the dominant key. All right. Uh, the answer is in the form of the subject, and this is important. It's intended to be heard as the subject. So no matter what key it's in, 
it is the subject, all right? Even though we're calling this the answer, because this is the exposition, all right? Subject, answer, subject, answer, all right? Or in a four voice. Um, if the intervals throughout the answer are exactly the same, exactly the same, all right? We call this a real answer. If, if, if one or more intervals in the answer are altered, the term is a tonal answer, all right? If they're altered, they're made uh, for tonal reasons. So you could actually figure out how to make something that isn't altered or you alter it. And normally, if you're going to get an altered altered uh, answer, it's going to alter it pretty quickly, all right? If it has a great big leap, this is the easiest way to do it. If it has a great big leap, make that great big leap to another note, all right? In other words, if it leaped up here, it might leap. Uh, up here. So let's just take a look at this. Um, mm, this is a leap of a, this is a leap of a sixth. Um, sorry, I'm just kind of looking at this. It's easier for me to look at it down here. Um, And it's also a sixth, okay? So um, I'm just going to, that's a major sixth, and uh, they're both major sixths. So uh, without going over it, I'm not going to do that right now. Everything, we, we won't be able to figure it out. But um, By the way, here, 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 here's where I'm, I'm, I'm looking at these things. Uh, I mean, I'm just reading certain points in here. Um, so, so again, the, the answer is traditionally in the dominant key, and if the intervals are exactly the same, it's a real answer, just like a real sequence used for modulating, or a tonal answer, all right, or a tonal sequence, which usually doesn't go anywhere. Um, so let's see. Um, so let's look at uh, example 383, which is where, right where I'm at. And um, so what we got is we got a subject and we have a counter subject. All right. So this is the, uh, the idea of um, what would happen here. So let's just read this for a second here. Uh, some fugues have a second counter subject, which appears simultaneously with the subject and the first counter subject. All right, so this is this is what I mean by this gets very confusing. All right, so this is from the Well-Tempered Clavier, book uh, book one or volume one. Uh, it's a two volume set. Uh, it uses two counter subjects. So you have counter subject one right here. And you have counter subject two. It, it has a completely different little motive in it. All right. So, so occasionally you get two of them, and we're going to listen to this. We're not going to get too deep into this because it's it's not the intent of this. The, what I want to present to uh, present the most difficult things ever. So here we go. Let's just listen to it. So, so again, here we got a subject, and um, remember I said we count downbeats, right? Okay. Right. Okay, so this is in 3-4, and I'm just kind of making sure, but I see I got a rest here, so I don't have anything on the downbeat. So in theory, it's one, two, three, four measures long, it lands on the downbeat here, all right? If it was 
if, if there was a note at the very beginning, it'd be one, two, three, four, five measures long. Do we understand that? That we count downbeats when we're counting out how long things are. Does everybody, do, do you both understand that? Yeah, so if it's a rest, yeah. don't count it. Yeah, if, if, if it doesn't start on the downbeat of the measure, then you don't count that measure. And one, two, three, and if it ended here, it'd only be three measures, even though there's this great big pickup into it, but it actually ends right there. So then we have counter subject and we have the answer right here. And that ends uh, right here. Uh, I want you to notice that there's a little line cru cruising up. And then, then I want you to look, see here's counter subject one and here's counter subject number two. All right, that's all I want to say. These things can get really complicated. All right, so, hmm. So that's kind of the exposition, all right? And after the exposition, we get episodes, uh, something called episodes. Um, episode, following the exposition, the episodes separate further entries of the subject during the remainder of the fugue. Episodes permit additional contrapuntual treatment and are useful for creating modulation. Creating modulation. Often these episodes, just so you know, they literally are used to modulate to a new key so we can have an entry of the subject in a different key. All right? So then the next thing I want to say is modulation is considered one of the strongest energy components of a few. You're almost, you're almost guaranteed to have a modulation. And often it's a sequence. All right. So page 185. Um, oh, I want to back up here. I'm sorry. Uh, this is what we've been talking about the subject uh, and I read about the episode and I'm sorry I want to back up so so here are when, when I when I said they could these subjects can be various lengths and character so here's Mozart's string quartet very 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 simple and here's Bach where he's got uh, pickups and 32nd notes and eighth notes so on and so forth here's Beethoven a whole bunch of quarter notes some eighth notes half note tied over very long subject here. This is this one is one two two measures long. This is one two three four five. This is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten. You know, uh, to the to the eleventh beat right there. All right. So that would be like an eleven measure thing. So Schumann, so on and so forth. And here, um, this is from Schumann also. Uh, and so the subjects can really vary around here. Um, so here's an example of a real answer. All right. Um, and I'm not going to go through everything, but uh, if you have your book, if you had a book as opposed to an online thing, or you could do it online, I call this two finger analysis. I would put my, my finger on the very first note and I would put my finger on the very first note of that, and I would say, oh, well, you know, uh, let me see, this is, uh, I can't see anything. It's heck when you get old. All right, this is B up to uh, D sharp, all right? So that interval's a, a major third, all right? So then I would go here, and this is uh, F sharp, uh, up to A sharp, all right? So that's a major third. And then I would move to the next one and I would say, well, this is uh, D sharp up to G sharp. That's a perfect fourth, right? And then I would say, this is uh, A sharp up to D sharp. That's a perfect fourth. And I would go on and I would have to figure that out through the whole thing, figure out if it's real or if it's tonal. So this is a, this is a real, um, example of it. Let's just take a listen to it. All right. 
And then down below it, we have an example of a tonal answer. So th this is going from B flat down to F. All right. So it's at the perfect fourth. Uh, then it's got this great big leap up here. So let's just say this is uh, this is a uh, F to uh, G flat. So that's like a minor ninth, right? Anybody, Carl? You're a professional. Uh, what you said that, uh, that this is F. This is F, and this is G flat. So that's a minor ninth, right? Yeah. All right. So look, we'll look at this tonal answer. So here we, uh, we have um, an F going down to a B flat. All right. So what's the interval between that? That's a that's a fourth, right? Or right B flat. Well, B flat up. That's a yeah. right. It's a fifth. It's a perfect right. fifth, right? Yeah, that's a perfect right. And this is a perfect fourth. So it, uh, there's automatically an adjustment right here. See it right there? That's a perfect fourth going down. This is a perfect fifth. And like I said, often that adjustment if in a tonal answer is going to be right toward the beginning. All right. Uh, and then we, we call this a minor ninth. And I'm just curious what this is going to be. Um, it's a uh, B flat up. To D flat. All right, so that's already a, a tenth. All right, so there's a couple of adjustments made here, and then it follows uh, the basic idea of it. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but let's just get a listen to this. So, you, you, I'll be honest with you, it's hard to really even tell at times. So I mean, the adjustments made to make it to to make it work, and so you really don't tell. Maybe you do, Carl, because you have a perfect pitch. Unlike me, uh, you you when you're listening to this, and then you listen to this, and you've trained your ears to really listen to this, you can probably tell right away that it's a real answer as opposed to a tonal answer. Um, but I'm not in your case, anyways. Um, here, here we are in the episode section again, and um, a lot of these uh, entries I couldn't find. But let's just take a, take a look at something right here. Um, so it's called invertible counterpoint. All right, and when you when we talk about invertible counterpoint, um, oh, what, let's talk about the sequence. Here's here's the sequence. Uh, and I don't have this, um, but if, if you look at the sequence, the sequence starts with this note, goes down to here, and has this tie, and then then it starts with this note, goes down here, and has this tie, and starts with this note, goes down here, and has this tie. And if you can see, if you just look at the long note right here, we have uh, we have B going down, and then the next long note is A, and the next long note is G sharp. Um, which is in the key signature because uh, it was G natural right here. Um, and, and that's really how you, you can hear these sequences. If you look down here, you got this two, almost two beat uh, sequence. That's the beginning note, which is F sharp, all right? And then the next beginning note is E, and the next beginning note is D, all right? So... Sequences are something that happens and then it falls down and it falls down in this case. There are other types of sequences. Um, I don't know what, what you learned in your theory class, Carl. Um, I only really teach falling fifths and I say, well, there are other types. You could have falling thirds and you could have uh, ascending seconds. And I usually point them out when, when we have them. Um, but usually... I, I don't, but I, I've noted that um, the book that you use just introduces everything like it happens all the time. So I'm guessing that's the case. So I'm going to tell you that falling fifths is probably the most common sequence. 
and ascending seconds will be really obvious because this will be the exact opposite. Instead of going down, it will you'll have that long note and then it will go up and then it will go up, you know, by second. So so that's to the way it works. So then we have this invertible counter counterpoint. Um, this is really hard to understand, but let me just uh, just I'm just gonna normally I, we would we would sit there and write this in the book, but this is a ten. This is a nine between these two notes, and then this is a ten and a nine and a six. All right, all right. I'm just gonna stop there. So we got we got. 10, 9, 10, 9, 6, or 10, 9, 10, 9, 6. So this is above this, all right? Now what's going to happen is we're going to invert the thing. This, that was this, is now above this, that was above that. Do you understand that? So you've got something here, and now you flip the two voices. So you got this here, and this here, and then the next measure, this goes down to here, and this and the other thing goes up there up there and yeah. that invert so they're inverting it and now if you if you read this again all right uh it's not going to have the same intervals but all the intervals are are going to be correct and it's and there's just, it's the exact same thing if you look at this it goes down you look at this it goes down and it goes down and then it goes up and the intervals here are six seven six seven and then ten all right in other words this was written against this to be able to turn around the other way and not have all the weird intervals that you're not allowed to have in, in this strict period of counterpoint. So if I go to the first measure, the very first measure, here are all the intervals. It's 10, 9, 10, 9, 6, 5, 8, 7, 10, and that 7 is a passing tone. Uh, it's like 8, 7, and then it's 10 because the bass moves up right here. So that's why we end up with 10, and then 9, and then 6, because the bass moves again, and that 9 is a, just a passing tone, and then 5. And then here, we have 6, 7, um, and then it's 6, 7 again. So this is the 7, and this is the 7, and they're all just passing tones. What's happening is because this is changing, the interval changes. Uh, and then we got 10, uh, and then we have an 11, and then we have a bass change, all right? Um, but anyways, then it's 8, 9, 6, 7, 10, and 11, all right? And all of these, all of these work. And we're really talking about these right here, all right? So that's as much as I want to say about invertible counterpoint, all right? It's a subject that if you go to grad school and you take Baroque music or you take a course on counterpoint, usually it's a two semester course. So you'll study species counterpoint first and then you'll study Bach counterpoint. So, I'm sorry, there was some weird noise right in my window. It's probably a bird ramming into it. Um, so, species counterpoint, um, if, if you had um, Dr. Simon, you probably learned some species counterpoint in, in, uh, in the uh, first two classes. Um, and so we spent a whole semester on, on counterpoint, the species counterpoint in grad school. Now let me just tell you, I had Bach counterpoint in undergrad school and I had a lot of trouble with it. It was, it was really hard. And the reason it was hard is because I didn't have species counterpoint before that. But then when I had, in grad school, I had species counterpoint and then everything made a lot more sense here, all right, in this, in this Bach counterpoint. But regardless, those are difficult classes. Enough said of that. All right, so, so that's, you, you find this stuff in the episodes, all right? So then we have something called the middle entries, all right? So you got the exposition, all right? Then you have an episode, and then you have a middle entry. And then you're going to have another episode, and another middle entry, and another episode, and another middle entry, and another episode, and it could go on forever, or it could only be a few of those, all right? And then you'll just have the final 
entry. So the middle entries, all right, after the exposition is complete and an episode has diverted us or diverted the listener's attention, the subject will reappear. It's going to reappear, all right? So these entries of the subject cons consist of as, as little as a single entry or a complete set of entries or something in between, all right? So you don't know what it is. Again, that goes back to the form. The only thing we know is the exposition is going to be the same. It's going to have, if it's got three voices, you're going to have a subject, an answer, and another subject. Four, you have subject, answer, subject, answer. Two, you have just the subject and the answer. That's the only thing that we know. Other than this, you're going to have middle entries, and they're going to be in different keys, maybe in the same key, maybe they change the mode. Who knows what it's going to be? But So it's difficult to find them. And the way, to, the way to find them is to memorize or listen to that very first subject that's played all by itself over and over a few times so you really kind of get to know what it is. All right? So in that, other keys than the tonic or home key are expected. And common devices for composers using these entries is something called stretto. All right, invertible counterpoint, change of mode, melodic inversion, retrograde augmentation, and diminution. Okay, let me re refresh you on what stretto is. Stretto is, let's say, in, in this case, we get the subject that comes in, and before the subject finishes, the answer enters. So somewhere during when the subject's going, the answer will enter. All right, here it is right here. So we have the subject right here, and the subject comes in again. All right. Um, you can see it right here. There it is right there. It's in the soprano. It goes below. Uh, and then it's, um, it doesn't have a tie because it just can use a dot. This had to use a tie. Uh, and then it's whatever, whatever, whatever's in the soprano voice going up. So let's see. Um, Again, I, I don't really have a, a lot of the a lot of these because they're really difficult to find. Number one, anyways. So strato. Now let me see what else did I say? Uh, invertible counterpoint. We just talked about that. Change of mode. That would just be if you're in G major, you change to G minor, or if you're in G minor, you change to G major. It's still in the same key. All right. A melodic inversion, they might invert, invert. If the theme, the subject's going up, they might make the subject go down. So you, 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 will, you will find those things. And that, that's really then starts to make it more complicated because then you don't have the rising and the falling that you're expecting in the subject. All right, so um, retrograde. So playing it backwards. Augmentation and diminution making notes shorter or making notes longer or larger, making notes shorter or larger. All right. Following that somewhere, most Jews have a feature, a statement of a subject at the end of the work. Okay. The final statement is considered the conclusion. It's not a middle entry. All right. So you got, uh, well, this, this statement is followed is followed by a final cadence to close the work. So Again, you got the exposition, then you got an episode, middle entry, episode, middle entry, episode, middle entry, episode, and then you have a middle entry, but if it's the last one, it's not called a middle entry, it's called the conclusion. So the other thing I want to say is, is most fugues feature, uh, and I'm not saying all of them, feature a big cadence at the end, and also usually a big cadence in the middle of it, all right, um, or more, but... When I say big cadence, one that's pretty obvious, all right? So otherwise, the whole thing is linear. Okay, so so what I want to do is I want to create a new share here. Uh, but da, 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 um, preview musical form analysis box. Um, there we go. All right, so you should be looking at my... Uh, OneDrive, which is where all these pieces of music are, of course. And I told you where you could get them. It's in the link here, which is in the modules.
and I got a fourth person. Who's that? And here's the link. Here's the, the terms that are due Thursday. Sam. Sam. Yay. Oh, okay. Huh? Huh? Is that Samuel Neal? Yeah. I'm just uh, no noting that I got another person here. So I'm just trying to oh, okay. keep my stuff going here. Um, all right. So I I got this right here. And let me just tell you, uh, we're going to listen to Box Little Fugue in G minor. And I only chose this because here, here it is right over here that because it's got music to it. Uh, the performance is not great. All right. Um, nor are most of these performances that have a player playing. All right. The, the good performances of it, um, uh, just so you know. Um, well, that's not really what I was looking for. Well, anyways, we're not going to worry about it. The good performances of this are um, other, other, usually something that was an actual recording of it. But anyways, this has a scroll on it. This is box little fugue in G minor. It goes like this. It goes dum dum dum. And sorry, Carl, I'm not in G probably. Dum Let me let me just show it to you. Uh, new share. Um, no, wrong new share. Uh, well, anyway, do, you, do, you, do you see the score? Fugue with BWV 578. Yeah. Johan Sebastian Bach. I'm sorry. Johan Sebastian Bach. Yeah, here it is. Da, 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 da. Ya ta 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 ti 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 ta 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 ta. And here it is right here. It comes in again. So this is. Oh, I know this. Yeah, you should know that. It's. Yeah, I think I've heard it. Yeah, it's probably one of the most popular simple fugues. And it's played on the organ. It's an organ. It's for organ. And, um, you know, the organ was the. You know how like you have rock music or really loud music, you know, like your earphones and you got them up full blast. Well, the organ yeah. was the rock music instrument of the Baroque period, uh, the classical period, the, the romantic period. Our orchestras got pretty big too, but this is really a, a kind of a rock music. Those those organs can get really going well. So it's it's because this is all all beats of the measure. It doesn't start with the measure. This is one, two, three, four, five. And it goes five. And then since this comes in right here, it's only five measures long. If this didn't come in somewhere, it would probably have been six measures long. But it's five measures long. And it comes in with a subject right here, which is one, two, three, four, five. And then... We got some other material here. Carl, do you remember what that's called? Mm, um, it's a little tail. Yeah. Uh, oh, that means a little tail or a link. Yeah. This is our link from the dominant key back to the tonic key. All right. So we're going to go back to that video and just watch it through that. Um, so let me see. New share. And uh, you can tell me if it's too loud or too soft. I'm just going to scroll here. And can you hear me talk? What do you think? Hit it, do it again. Okay, I'm going to just play, and I'm going to say something, too. All right, who knows where we're at? I don't. Yeah, you good. good. Okay, all right. Let's start from the beginning, then. All right. So this is a four-voice fugue. All right, so you're going to get subject, answer in the dominant, get that little tail or link, then subject and answer in the dominant. When that's all over, you're immediately in episode number one. Here we go. I hope. And 
Spencer in the dominant. Here's the the cow or Kodera or Link. And subject again in the tonic key. And answer on the foot pedal in the dominant key. All right, so right at that point that I just stopped it, right here on this beat right here, that is the end of the exposition. So immediately here, we are now in what's called a middle entry, all right? And again, middle entries are used to, you know, go somewhere else, modulate, do something, all right? And so now what we're 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 gonna focus on listening for is dum 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 is is that right there because that's gonna be um did I say this was a middle entry? Anybody? It's an episode. If I said middle entry, this is an episode. I just can't remember. But okay. but ep go ahead. No, I just said okay. Okay, all right. I, I, I'm not sure if I said middle entry because I'm just talking. This is an episode. And then we're going to listen for dum, 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 da, da, dum, 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 or whatever. To have our first middle entry. Here we go. I'm going to back it up just a little bit. You hear the sequence? Da, da, da. Yeah, yeah. There it is. Dum, dum, dum. That's all part of it. And we're in another episode. You're the sequential like material. Yeah, we're in the we're in it again. This is a middle entry. We're in an episode. Do the sequence. Here we go. Middle entry. There's a sequence here again. We're going somewhere else in an episode. You can't hear it very well, but we're actually in a middle entry. To the soprano. Now we're in another episode. Hear that sequence? Now we're out of the sequence. That's, that's, that's an ascending second sequence here. Listen to this. Let me back it up just a little bit. It's moving up, moving up. Now it's going down. Ah, there's an entry. Ah. There's the big yeah. kid. Yeah. Whoa. That was yeah. a lot. So, that very last entry, was that a middle entry? Based on my lecture? Um, yeah. No. No, it was not. Okay. <laughs> it's the conclusion. 
The last entry is not called the middle entry. It's called the conclusion. The conclusion, most views feature a statement of the subject at the end of the work. The final statement is considered the conclusion, not a middle entry, all right? So in other words, okay. you're gonna have an exposition, you're gonna have an episode, middle entry, episode, middle entry, episode, middle entry, episode, middle entry, but if it's the last one, it, when you figure it out, it's the last one, it's not the middle entry, it is the conclusion. And following that, that statement, normally you're gonna get a cadence, all right? So, uh, this, is, this is a relatively simple, few. So we're going to spend a lot of time looking at some other fugues. And and guess whose fugues we'll be looking at? Mostly ah. box. Yeah. They're the ones that are really accessible. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, Bremi, you're a choir person. Have you ever yeah. heard of Mozart's Requiem? Yes. It's one of my favorites. Okay. You know, there's a double fugue in that one. And we'll get to oh, talk. I didn't know. Oh, yeah, there's a double fugue in there. All right. Yeah, I have that on my phone, my Apple Music Library. All right, I'm, I'm, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I just want to, speaking of the Noxos Music Library, right now it's not working, just so you know. Oh, okay. So, um, this, this one, um, I, uh, I'll, I'll be eventually posting, but you can easily find it by typing in uh, Bach, Little Fugue in G minor, hit enter. And then you okay. probably the third one down will be scrolling. Let's just look. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bach, Little Fugue in G minor. And I usually go down and choose organ because there's lots of piano versions, orchestra versions, so on. So if I choose organ here, so this is what you're going to have, and uh, there it is right there. It's the only one with music. Uh, I listened to this version. He's not very good. This is probably a real good version. I didn't actually have time to listen to it. Uh, but, of course, you're only looking at Bach's face the whole time. Um, and so I'm trying to make these things, uh, since we're on the computer, making them a little bit better. Um, I didn't listen to this one. Uh, I did not listen to this one. Uh, I, I listened to a few of them. I listened to this one, and the picture of who's here is not the picture of the person playing, so I was confused, so on and so forth. But anyways, this is the end of the class. Make sure you go out and vote today if you haven't voted. And um, I'm going to see you on Thursday, and we're closing up time, and let's see. Uh, and me and Carl already talk. All right, everybody have a good day. All right, I'm going to uh, stop the share. And does anyone have any questions? No. All right, I got to go vote then. Everybody, I'm going to end the meeting for everybody, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.